Hi, everybody, and welcome to the fifth episode of our Insight series hosted by BSI in partnership with McAfee. I'm Connor Hogan, the Global Practice Lead for Privacy at BSI Consulting, and I'm delighted today to be joined by my colleague Sarah Ledgerwood, who is the Manager in Data Management and Forensics Technologies here in BSI. First of all, uh, please make sure to subscribe to receive notifications for the future episodes. Um, and in today's podcast, what we're going to be talking about is all things interna- international data transfers, Schrems 2, Brexit, and all of that wonderful stuff that seems to be happening at the rate of knots right now, with the data protection slant, of course. Uh, Sarah, welcome. Um, and uh, might I maybe throw the first question at you uh, today? What do you make of everything that's been happening over the last number of months with regards to international data transfers? We had the, the Schrems 2 decision um, prior to that. We obviously had um, uh, the pri- Privacy Shields uh, um, genesis, the, uh, the Safe Harbor Agreement being thrown out. And with Brexit imminently approaching, um, there's significant data transfers uh, impacts that that organizations need to consider. What do you make of all of this? And and in in reality, where are we now on the international data transfer front? Hey, Connor. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I think this is such an exciting topic right now because so much is going on and so much is happening in the whole entire area of privacy. And as you mentioned, in the wake of the Schrems 2 decision in July, it's been a, a bit unsure, I would say. You know, companies and organizations aren't really sure how to proceed with international data transfers, in particular in the U.S., since the privacy shield um, was struck down. Really just not sure how to proceed. And when when the European Court of Justice made this decision, as courts do, they they tell you what not to do, but they don't really tell you what to do. So with the new guidance the European Data Protection Board issued last week, it's a bit confusing. And also there is clarification in there. They've released a new six-step process for planning your data transfers. And I'm wondering, Connor, what do you think of the guidance? I get to step four where you need to identify and adopt supplementary measures. And I feel like it's a little unclear for organizations. What would be a, a good way to proceed? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I definitely feel the, the pain of uncertainty, Sarah. Um, you're right. The, the July decision, you know, the, the court made it very clear that, that this was not acceptable transfers to the U.S. under the privacy shield. So the privacy shield is gone and we were left with sort of this, this vacuum. Okay. Well, how can we proceed? And the GDPR obviously makes provisions for international data transfers and there are multiple, um, mechanisms by which you can transfer data, a uh, personal data, of course, internationally and outside the EU. Um, the European Data Protection Board has taken a little bit of time since July to, to piece together a roadmap, right? Um, and this roadmap, as you mentioned, six steps in it. Um, you know, the step one being having to map your data transfers. So know what your data transfers are, identify what your relevant transfer mechanisms are. Uh, step three, uh, assess what the sufficiency of those non-EEA protections might be. Is there anything really in the law or the practice of the third country to which you're transferring that might um, undermine European data protection laws? And then step four, uh, yes, adopting supplementary measures. And this was the big question mark, I feel, uh, following the July ruling in the European Court of Justice. What are these additional supplementary measures that would be deemed suitable or necessary to bring the level of protection uh, of the data that's transferred out of the EU up to the EU standard? And what do we mean by the EU standard? We don't necessarily mean that it is the same as what might be provided for a data subject under the GDPR. But what, what the, the, the Court of Justice is looking for is essential equivalence. In other words, where can we have essentially a guarantee of sort that the data will be protected in line with the European um, perspective um, of privacy? So these supplementary measures that the European Data Protection Board has thought through are based on a number of scenarios. 
you know, if you're a data controller that you're and you're transferring data to a, a, a third party processor outside of Europe, what are the technical measures and what are the maybe the technical security measures that could be considered? But also from a contractual perspective, what can you put in place as a contractual agreement that binds your data processor to uh, to um, uh, implement certain control practices from a contractual nature? And that's all well and good, you know, making sure that as a controller, we've got things written down on, on paper. We're looking for maybe it's uh, high grade encryption, encryption of the data while it's in transit and indeed while it's at rest. But the big question for me really is whatever about the contractual commitments that you sign up to or um, whatever about the technical controls that you put in place, nothing will stop uh, or in my mind, uh, and, and this is purely my opinion, Sarah, but nothing could override or stop, uh, you know, a government agency from enacting or, or invoking a piece of legislation that allows them uh, the ability, technical or otherwise, to access data, which might include personal data that could be transferred. So for the, the biggest part for me of the European Data Protection Board's guidance is that those technical measures, yes, they might be very good, and they might be appropriate and they might be very technical. But unless there is a guarantee and unless as a data controller, you can have certainty that the data won't be subject to, you know, surveillance and, and potential, uh, you know, obviously in the case of the US, FISA 702 requests, for instance, then there's only so much that those contractual commitments and those supplementary measures will actually be able to achieve. So. In my mind, there is still an element of uncertainty because in practice, something that's contractual in nature can't override the law. And I think that's the fundamental issue here is that there's a, a conflict between European data protection law and, and the, the historical concept that Europeans um, have come to know and, you know, like myself, have come to love, which is fundamental rights to data protection and other jurisdictions interpretation of the right to privacy um you know it's it's just fundamentally different and i don't know what the the solution is here because i fear that in a matter of months or in a number of years we could find ourselves in a situation where we have a, a Schrems 3 going through the European Court of Justice in that whatever the replacement is, and, and I think we do need some form of replacement for Privacy Shield, something that's a lot more structural, that underwrites those data transfers out of Europe to the US, that enables s such a large amount of commerce to happen on a daily basis. I think we need something a lot more structural than just a contractual agreement. And, and I don't know, Sarah, if you have any thoughts on what that might look like or whether that could be a possibility given, you know, the, 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 the stark difference between European data protection and North American um, privacy. I agree with you. I agree that we're still in a period of uncertainty here, especially in regards to data transfers from the EU to the US because of this fundamental just difference between the way we look at privacy in the US versus the EU. And there's no doubt in the EU, the GDPR has set the standard for privacy worldwide and privacy standards. In the US, we, we're still not there. We, we don't have that fundamental right to privacy over your personal data. And, you know, you'll be seeing what's happening there, and I know you've seen some developments. And so I think where this is going is ultimately someday the hope overall would be a U.S. federal privacy legislation that would reach that adequacy standard that the GDPR would recognize. And then we could get back to free flowing data and not have so much uncertainty. Um, when will that happen? Unclear. We have the... The legislation um, that was passed in California first, the, the CCPA, and now just recently a big development in the recent election was that in California, the voters passed Proposition 24 to pass the California Privacy Rights Act, so calling that the CPRA, um, and that is at this point the most sweeping privacy and data protection law in the U.S., and I think it's going to set the standard for other states to follow and then hopefully leading to a federal privacy uh, law in the U.S. that would create uniformity 
Well, in California, one one big thing that it does is it it establishes a an agency that will be able to actually enforce the CCPA, which they didn't have in California before. It also gives consumers additional rights over their own personal data. Um, and that, that type of situation just hasn't existed in the U.S. up until now. So I, I do think we're heading towards U.S. federal privacy legislation. I really do. It's just it's just there's still significant division on what that will look like. And, and getting there is going to take some time. It, especially the two things that are outstanding to agree on, would there be a private right of action for EU citizens in U.S. courts? That's a big one that is going to be tough to, to get by in, in the U.S. under the current state. Um, so, so that's kind of where we are, I think. Yeah, re- really interesting, especially on, on Proposition 24, creating, um, as you mentioned, the, uh, an independent oversight mechanism, um, the first real data protection authority in U.S. privacy law, um, which is which is one of the essential guarantees that the EU looks for when it's assessing adequacy. And and you know, yes, we saw the guidance issue from the European Data Protection Board with regards to international data transfers. We also saw their updated. Um, recommendations on the essential guarantees, especially for data transfers to jurisdictions with surveillance, on one of which they've updated their guidance to be about that, um, the independent oversight mechanism. And, and I, I think it's hugely encouraging to see that this is the way that we're, we're sort of progressing um, in this European versus North America um, sort of I won't say war because it's it's not a war, but it's just a, a debate as to what privacy is and what versus data protection. And it's just really interesting as a practitioner in the space and, and as we advise organizations on both sides of the Atlantic with regards to privacy compliance, um, you know, on, in, in the GDPR flavor, um, looking at access, looking at the private rights of action that people um, have, uh, and, and, and then over in the U.S., in in sort of the, the U.S. flavor of privacy um, and it, it being seen as much more of a consumer right rather than a, a fundamental right of the individual, the data subject. So I think you're right, Sarah. I think we need to see a convergence of those two positions. Um, and I think in reality, the, the bigger leap is probably on that U.S. federal side because the Court of Justice has laid down in numerous decisions over and over again about fundamental protections, fundamental rights, data controller obligations, uh, data controller responsibilities to the data subjects, um, including in those transfers. And what I think makes it very difficult for data controllers now is un- under this very clear established case law, um, Controllers are responsible for assessing the impact of those data transfers to their data subjects. And by and large, organizations in Europe don't know about U.S. domestic legislation. And I'll put my hands up. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a solicitor. I am very involved in data protection law, and we're supporting numerous clients go through transfer impact assessments on the back of the Schrems 2 decision. The European Data Protection Board guidance has been hugely helpful in this past week, as have the draft standard contractual clauses, the updated clauses from the European Commission, um, which approach it from a completely different perspective now in, in being able to build uh, standard contractual clauses under the GDPR in a modular fashion, including the provision for processor to processor um, clauses or contracts and processor to controller contracts. And, and look, that's all great, but actually, you know, where the rubber hits the road, um, you know, in the SME, in the European data controller that's responsible for doing those transfer impact assessments, it just, it's very complicated. So I don't think there's any great solution except for people to educate themselves more, make themselves more aware of what is going on, read up on the guidance. And why do I say that? Well, because primarily it's not the only international data transfer um, show in town, right? EU to US is a significantly large uh, data transfer. But one data transfer that strikes me square in the nose, I think with an awful lot of clients that we've been dealing with lately, is that from the EU to the UK. And that really comes into focus as we progress towards the end of this calendar year 2020 and the UK's uh, transition period in terms of its withdrawal from the EU comes to uh, a close and 
you know, unless there is a similar discussion around transfers to the UK, we're effectively going to be in the same position. Um, I, I don't know, Sarah, do you see these sorts of issues come come up with, with your clients, especially given the sort of the, the much more legal environment in which you work with um, with your clients on, on forensics and e-discovery projects? Yeah, so that's interesting. I think, you know, just starting off where, where you left off mentioning um, the situation coming up very soon now with Brexit, and I am seeing this this is a concern among among my clients and really just, again, that uncertainty of what will happen if there's a no-deal Brexit and what will happen to data transfers between the UK and other countries as the UK will automatically be considered a third country under GDPR. And I'm not really sure what what clients what to tell clients because of the uncertainty. Um, you know, I don't know. Have you seen this? If if I were to put myself in the shoes of my client, let's say, what type of guidance can we give them? What break it down to? How do you start? You know, how do we keep the international data transfers going if this happens? Oh, that's that's the million dollar question, isn't it, Sarah? I, I think I think to be fair and to be completely frank, the the solution in data transfers in the Brexit situation are exactly the same as the solution to data transfers in the US or any other third country. Um because the European Court of Justice, the European Data Protection Board, the EU as a whole, the Commission, the, the, there are rules there, and there are um, there's a, there's an established framework for how di- personal data can leave the EU. GDPR puts that framework in place, and the European Data Protection Board is supposed to monitor it. Uh, the European Commission has some tools that are available to it as well, um, and the mechanisms by which we transfer data out of Europe regardless of to what third country it might be, but how we transfer data out of Europe full stop is is pretty clear. We can either do it on the basis of an adequacy decision, such that Canada currently has, for instance. Um, The US did have um, an adequacy decision of sort under Privacy privacy Shield. That's no longer, obviously, um, valid and has been thrown out. The UK, though, as you rightly pointed out, becomes a third country overnight at the stroke of midnight on the 31st of December going to the 1st of January 2021. Um, and unless there's an adequacy decision before that, then the UK is a third country. And in that situation, then there are certain transfer mechanisms, transfer mechanisms that can be put in place. And they're inherent on the data controller really to understand what they might be. Um, the obvious one is to uh, look at, at contractual provisions like standard contractual clauses. And the European Commission's new draft clauses are, will hopefully be approved um, following public consultation and any updates prior to Christmas. But, you know, whether that time frame is realistic is anyone's guess. And, and then it's just a matter of, of papering contracts with your uh, data processors in the UK. So if you're a data controller right now in the EU, in Ireland, in France, in Germany, and you've got a, a third-party data processor in the UK. Right now, you've no you've no problem, right? There's no issue under law with the, the personal data transfers. But as soon as Brexit formally happens, and, and realistically, as soon as Brexit closes, then there is an issue, and we need to have a solution in place. Standard contractual clauses could be it. There are alternative mechanisms, such as getting the express consent, for, for instance, um, uh, of the data subjects, but that is not going to be applicable in very many organizations' cases. So right now, with the uncertainty around Brexit, I think the the best course of action is exactly what the European Data Protection Board has set out for international data transfers post trends from the US. Know what data transfers you have and know what mechanisms you currently rely on, whether that's the GDPR, obviously because the GDPR is in force right now in the UK, and um, our standard contractual clauses, and make sure that whatever the transfer mechanism that will make your transfer sustain its legal status post-Brexit um, is either updated or put in place as quickly as possible. Um, I, I think the the biggest problem, you know, and problem is probably too strong of a word, but the, the biggest risk relating to Brexit is that we over, we actually over-egg the, the data protection impact. Because let's not forget, right now, the UK is still, because of the transition period, a member of the EU. 
on the 1st of January next year, it's outside the EU. But today, the GDPR still applies in the UK. And in reality, on the 1st of January next year, the GDPR will actually still apply. It, 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 by te- it, it's a technicality, and which means that it, it, the GDPR is no longer applicable in the UK, but it's going to be um, on their their, uh, their their statute books in um, the form of a UK GDPR. And there's going to be no material difference at all. So fundamentally, the protections for personal data are still going to be the same and, and quite you know analogous to the current EU provisions. What the risk is, though, is that in the future, the UK's law diverges from the EU. And that's going to be a big challenge for organizations um, who have cross-border transfers either to or from the UK going forward. Because where the law diverges, we're talking about a separate jurisdiction. We're talking about maybe separate potentially separate rights um, and and separate uh, oversight mechanisms and all of the protections that would be built into European data protection law potentially being different or fundamentally altered under future uh, UK legislation. And of course, this is all hypothetical, but it presents a problem long term from a compliance perspective. But I feel that and the advice that that our our DPOs have been working with our clients to sort of uh, to, to bring them through is very much that pragmatic. Know what you have know what transfer mechanism you currently have and, and put in place remediation actions or remedial uh, controls as, as you, uh, insofar as you possibly can and keep these things under review because as things change, you might need to look elsewhere. So Brexit is going to be very interesting, of course, from a, a, a data protection perspective. Um, but, you know, it's not, I don't think it's the only um, uh, uh, international data transfer that needs to be in scope. And, and the concept of, of global data transfer is this global um, and, and international data transfer landscape that is built up with the, the rate of, of development of technology and outsourcing, etc., presents numerous difficulties uh, with organizations. One of the things, though, that my clients often ask me is, Connor, how can we can we get our data in order? And because fundamentally, regardless of where you're transferring your data, the European Data Protection Board guidance is very clear. You need to know what you have, much like in Article 30 under the GDPR, knowing what you have, have a record of processing activities. And that's the starting point. So I don't know, Sarah, is there is there sort of a, a, an example in the e-discovery and forensics world about how we can bring to to to, I suppose, bear a, a better vision or a better knowledge of what data we have, where it is, and so that these compliance issues, which, you know, will crop up from time to time, can be better managed going forward? Yeah, so this is a really interesting scenario that we encounter every day in the e-discovery industry. And in the e-discovery industry, we're dealing with enormous amounts of data, varying data types in complexity every day, new data types, more data, mountains of data. So I feel like knowing where your data is, that's something we're always looking at in e-discovery in order to prepare that data for litigation or regulatory investigations or even internal actions. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, it's interesting because you're killing two birds with one stone, I guess you might say, by getting your data in order for GDPR, you're also getting it in order for potential litigation. And one solution or one interesting thing that I've seen happening is as clients move to the cloud, um, there's been an interesting transformation because their data is moving to the cloud. It's, It's easier to manage. They know more where their data is. It's easier to go in there and find personal data you know, locate everything that you need to locate. And that's been a great transformation. So this move to the cloud, and for example, many clients um, are on Microsoft 365 now, and there's built-in functionality within Microsoft 365 that allows you to find your data much easier. It's all in one place, helps you know exactly what you have and tackle that question of what data do I have, which I think is the overarching question that is the most difficult challenge for every client I'm encountering right now. And and I would just say one overarching also theme of this is, and I think the data protection authorities would also agree with, 
is this concept of data minimization. So not only knowing where all your data is, but putting in place a better data minimization policy so that you're not keeping all this old legacy data that's going to end up being searched when, for example, you get a data subject access request in. You don't want to spend all your time and your money searching this old legacy data because you don't have a data minimization policy in place. You're not getting rid of data that's no longer relevant. And and I think this is a, this is really going to be really important as data grows. And it, it you know you just don't need to be holding on to all this data anymore. Yeah, and, and and data minimization is is one of the fundamental pillars of um, data protection principles in in Europe, and and it makes sense even outside of a a data protection or, or personal data um, uh, sense as well. Why would you hold on to data full stop if you no longer need it? Um, or if you don't even know what it is, you know, and, and disciplines around information classification, information governance, uh, records management, and of course, um, data minimization go a significant way towards helping you mature your abilities uh, and your capabilities for managing not only compliance risk, but the, 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 um, I suppose the ability to react to things as they happen from an event perspective, whether that is a breach, whether it's an access request, whether it is a legal hold on data or a discovery order as well. So um, I, I think the the sort of e-discovery space um, can probably teach an awful lot of organizations uh, some huge benefits and, and I won't say lessons but some some significant upside uh, I think or rather there is significant upside um, for organizations to learn from e-discovery technology from e-discovery capabilities and e-discovery practices um, especially in the context of that cloud uh, move as you've mentioned and of course in the backdrop of international data transfers. Um, Sarah, I, this has been a hugely interesting conversation for me because I, I think it's 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 current, it's uh, it's relevant not only to my clients but to our own organisation in an international um, uh, perspective as well. And it's something that I don't think is going to go away because of the uncertainty that we've spoken about. Um, is there is there anything um, I suppose for a, a final parting thought that you might have um, that that you want to to highlight maybe that that organisations should um, consider. Uh, you know, outside of outside of all of this flux, outside of the, all of this certainty, that seems to be uh, the only the only uh, sort of consistent element to international data transfers and international data protection at the moment. Sure, just taking it back to the e-discovery space and where we're at, we have you know developed technology over the years that's already there in place that I think can be very useful in the future for all of this data privacy problems and issues. And for example, in my group at BSI, we've moved all of our clients to the cloud with a technology called Relativity, Relativity One, where we host all of our clients' cases. Um, it's an amazing technology where you literally can get right to what you need immediately. Find that PII, find anything that you're looking for, get to that data quickly by searching, redact out what you need. That technology is there, and I think it could be very helpful in the privacy space it's from everything from responding to those DSARs, those sub data subject access requests, to um, just locating any data that you need under GDPR. And it's an interesting development. I can see these, this e-discovery space coinciding with the information governance space and overlapping with privacy. It's all and cybersecurity too, actually, all kind of coming together. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I have to say the, the 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 exposure that I've had to um, the likes of Relativity One and, and e-discovery tools and tech uh, for some of my clients that had what I would term weaponized subject access requests or rather complicated um, cases um, that they had to deal with. Um, its responsiveness, its its ability to to um, I, to, to, to make things seem um, not as dark, uh, maybe when organizations are, are, you know, panicking and throwing as many resources as, as they possibly can at historically manual and arduous processes has been hugely beneficial. Sarah, um, my sincere thanks to you 
um, for, for joining me today. Um, it's been really, really interesting. And I think um, the international data transfers space, um, the backdrop against uh, evolving data protection law and privacy laws worldwide is, is only going to continue. Um, and uh, I, I definitely think the it's a space to watch, right? The the uncertainty will continue for a period of time, but as things crystallise, as regulators, as the European Data Protection Board, as the EU and as the US maybe grinds their gears and um, uh, gets their head around that that negotiating table, um, as we progress with Brexit, things will become clearer. Um, and all we can do as privacy practitioners, I think, is um, is try and ride the wave, uh, keep reading the guidance, and and to keep talking about these things because um, we can uh, probably lose ourselves in the detail very quickly um, and it makes sense to, to talk the, these things out. So my sincere thanks to you for, for joining me today um, and indeed to our listeners. We uh, we hope you enjoy the fifth episode of this, our sixth part, part insight series on privacy and compliance in the cloud. Uh, and many thanks for joining us again. In our last episode, the sixth episode, we will be talking about the blurred lines uh, of privacy um, and indeed remote working and shadow IT. So plenty to come still. Finally, please make sure to subscribe for the upcoming episode and to receive notifications for future releases in our six part series on our website. And we look forward to talking to you then. Sarah, thanks again. Thank you.